Happy New Year. Turn to one of your neighbors, grab a hand, give a hug, give a Happy New Year to somebody next to you. Good morning, everybody. It's exciting to be here and share the word with you the first part of the year. We have some visitors here, too, so be welcoming to everybody. Be on your best behavior, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm going to share a stor- short story with you from, from uh, my past, and we'll get into the word. <clears throat> uh, about five years ago, my son was born, right around this time of year, a little bit before Christmas, he was born, Vincenzo. And uh, right after he was born, everyone wanted to see him, so they came and they touched him and, of course, got him sick, right? And so uh, it was Christmas Day couple of weeks, maybe a month or two after he was born, and he got sick, and he got really, really sick, and uh, after a short amount of time, we noticed that he wasn't getting better, and then in the middle of the night, Christmas night, he stopped breathing at home, and we ended up taking him to the hospital, and, uh, you know, they, they fixed him up a little bit, and he, start, he started just getting worse and worse. Anybody know what RSV is? Respiratory virus? If you and I get it, it's not a big deal, but if a one-month-old kid gets it, it's pretty bad. Not too much they can do. So we were there for three days in the hospital. All of his numbers were getting worse. And uh, I remember we, uh, at the time, I had a friend, Pastor David Dean. I don't know, you guys probably know who he is. We were in the hospital for a day or two. We were living in a different state. And we texted him and said, hey, man, this is what's going on. Please just be praying. He's like, I'm going to start fasting for you right now. He was fasting and praying, and we were in the hospital with just nothing but bad hope. And I remember the doctor came in, and his numbers were just declining for like three days straight. And his, his um, oxygen saturation was down, so he wasn't getting much air, all this kind of stuff like that, right? His numbers were just crashing, and, and the doctor comes in and says, I oh, don't really know what we're going to do from here. Uh, his numbers aren't getting better. He's not getting better. They had tubes in his nose and his mouth, and little kid, like this big, right? And uh, so we don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to have to take some serious measures next. And I uh, remember he walked out of the room, and my wife and I were just sitting there like, what the heck are we going to do? And the first thing that I remember we did was we called our pastor, and I just started crying. I think he picked up the phone. I was just crying. I was like, man, I don't know what the heck to do. He's here, and we've heard this horrible news, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And this is our baby boy. And he's like, just, just chill. Just, we're just going to pray. And so he starts praying, and I remember he's praying, and I'm just crying while he's praying, and my wife is crying while he's praying. And I kid you not, this is like, while he's praying, his numbers start going up. His numbers didn't go up for three days straight. They were only getting worse. While he's praying, the numbers start going up and up and up. And I'm not joking. By the end of the prayer, the numbers were almost normal, and we were released a couple hours later. Praise God. God works in our lives sometimes, and I think that he wanted me to eventually tell that story. But man, it's just on the topic of faith, what we're going to go into today, here's my challenge to myself and to us. If I didn't call If I didn't call him in faith, if I didn't call him in faith, what would have happened? And in our own lives, if we don't call on God in faith, what on earth is going to happen? I'm going to read to you, uh, let's let's open up our Bibles and then we'll pray. Let's go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 in the New Testament. We'll get right into the Word this morning. No better place to be. Mark chapter 5, we're going to be reading quite a few verses together. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. We all know the story, a lot of us know the story. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. We all there, amen? All right, Mark chapter 5, 21. When Jesus had had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she may be healed and lived. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak or his jacket, his, his garment. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her blood, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, came. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said... Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talith kumi which means, little daughter, I say to you, get up. Immediately the little girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Let's pray. Holy God, be with us in a mighty way today, Lord. Let your spirit move on this place. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So there was this crowd of people <clears throat> that got up that morning and decided to make their way to the side of the lake. Some of them went because somebody asked them to go. Some of them went because they had just been going for a while. That was kind of their habit. Some of them went because one of their friends was going. All these people had different reasons for why they were going, but one of them was going because he wanted to meet Jesus. Church, why are you here? Why do you come? He came because he wanted to meet Jesus. And so he made it to the edge of that lake this man, Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, he, was, he, had, he would wear nice jackets and he would look prestigious and people would bow down to him. And, and he, was, he was kind of, the, it's called the College of Elders. He was the one in charge of, of uh, getting preachers or organizing events or doing Harvest Carnival or whatever, right? He was the one in charge of kind of doing all that stuff. So he was a revered man. He was certainly not bowing down to anybody's feet. Yet, we see that when, when Jesus arrives with these teenagers, these 12 teenagers that would be following him around. When Jesus arrives, immediately Jairus changes his position a little bit because he had a problem at home, right? He just left his house where he had been there for maybe weeks watching his daughter get worse and worse. Her vitals are just going down, remember? Everything is getting worse and worse and worse. And so he does the last thing that he can think of to do. The only hope that he thought he had was he ran like crazy to Jesus. So he gets there, and he finally gets to this place where he sees this crowd, and he's kind of getting past all these people. And remember, this is before the cross. This guy kind of is still just a carpenter. Isn't he just from that one place where nothing good comes out of there? And I'm a mighty man of God. And he runs to him. And the first thing that he does, the first thing that he does is he falls at his feet. That's the first thing that he does. You know how we have these silly things about the axe prayer and all these different do 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 The first thing that he does is he falls at his feet and he worships him. He falls at Jesus' feet, and he worships him. There is no cross yet. There is no resurrection yet. All the mighty things that we read about later, that stuff hasn't happened yet. But he still falls at his feet. And we know all of this 
And how often do we fall at our feet for Jesus? But there he is in front of Jesus, bowing down, and he just begs. Come on, parents, you know how it would feel. He just begs God, please just come with me. My daughter is sick, and she's actually at the edge of death. Will you please come with me? Praise God for the kind of God that he is. He accepts 100% of applications. 100%. Could you imagine applying somewhere and they're like, you're good, right? He just takes 100%. Whoever comes to me, all come to me who are weary. All come to me who are heavy laden. All of you, just come, just come. And there's these crowds of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. We read somewhere where he's feeding like 20,000 people. And there's these crowds. And there's this one guy just kind of like getting his way through that actually has faith to try to get past all the other people to finally get to meet Jesus. And then the next word is, so Jesus went with him. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him. You have been there where you went to a retreat or you decided to start praying more or you're doing your Bible for a year or whatever it is. You you kind of decided to change something a little bit. And then finally, like finally, you link up with God. Finally, you feel like, okay, now we're walking in step with one another. Finally, I'm with God. And you're just walking like, man, we're going to do mighty stuff now. I'm finally with God. I finally have my spiritual life back. I finally feel good again. And then all of a sudden, Where is he? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, where are you? And he finally gets back and he sees Jesus kind of like in this crowd. And all of a sudden there's this woman talking to his Jesus. So he turns around and he, he must have walked back and he sees, he gets there just in time to hear Jesus say, Who touched me? This big crowd of people. I know when I was actually just with my dad last week, and we were leaving something. We had to get somewhere. We were going to a lunch with, there was like 15 of us going. And some guy stopped him when we were coming out, and he started talking to my dad and talking to my dad and talking to my dad and talking to, you know how it is, right? Just keep on talking and keep on talking. And my dad's like, I have to go. I'm really sorry. I have to go. And you know, like when you're a little kid, your mom's just like, come on, mom, let's go, right? And she just talks to everybody. That's my dad. He just talks to everybody. Kind of like being around with Pastor Jerry. Pastor Jerry just talks to everybody. <laughs> and uh, so you know how, this, how Jairus must have felt, right? He's like, come on, don't you know what's going on? Let's go. But Jairus, uh, but Jesus is just chilling. Jesus is not in a rush. The only time we see Jesus in a rush is to come from heaven to earth to save us. So he's just there. And he's talking to this woman. What on earth are you doing? And how discouraging that was, how discouraging that is to be all linked up with Jesus, to be walking the direction. As a matter of fact, Jairus is probably like pushing people to like, this way, Jesus, this way, this is my house, this way. And he's just linking with him and walking with him. And how discouraging it would have been to lose Jesus on that walk. So this woman is there with him. And this is the time, I think Norma said it during prayer, we saw what God has done. And so it gives us faith for the future. But he's there and he sees that God is no longer with him, or Jesus is no longer with him, talking with him. And this is the time in our lives where we get to actually build character. Remember what was just read in Romans 5? All these things that we want and, and, and through all this suffering, all the stuff that just comes on us and all the waiting. Imagine if we had a God just, I want to get better, ding. That requires zero faith. That's just a, just a magic genie that you rub. But faith is, is, builds in this waiting period. And imagine the faith that it took Jairus to run to Jesus. And imagine the faith that it takes you to run to Jesus when it looks like there's absolutely no hope. But this is when our faith is built And around that same time, when this little girl was born, a woman in town started bleeding. About 12 years ago, 
she started getting sick and sick and sicker and sicker and sicker. You can imagine what that would be like as a woman just completely exhausted, low blood pressure, just feeling yucky. And as a matter of fact, she was unclean, so she couldn't do a lot of the normal stuff. Remember where Jairus worked? She couldn't even go there. She couldn't even go to the synagogue. She couldn't, she couldn't cook meals for her food. She couldn't hug a husband if she had a husband. She was completely cut off. And yet this is who Jesus is looking for. And, it, and we read, where are we at? Verse 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she actually grew worse. These doctors likely knew that they could not help her and yet still tried. And, and I was reading some different stuff that they would try back then. They would have them carry around a bag of corn and say, just carry around this bag of corn or drink these crazy elixirs. Or one of them was they would have ashes of an ostrich egg, and they'd have to carry that around with them. And all these ridiculous things that they would keep on trying to make this woman do. And everything was ridiculous except for her running to Jesus. And everything that we do, besides running to Jesus, is absolutely ridiculous. If we're not first running like crazy to Jesus, it's as silly as carrying around some ostrich eggs. We're just trying all of our own stuff and reading our own things and just trying to enhance ourselves and doing everything on our own. It's ridiculous. Come to me, all of you. But she was only getting worse. She was only getting worse. And then something happened. She heard something. She heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. And when you hear something, that means somebody told her about Jesus. Hmm. Somebody told her about Jesus, so she heard about Jesus. That's not where it stopped. Then she did something about it. See, what's the difference between belief and faith? Huh? If she could have just believed and been saved, she could have stayed at home and done nothing. What's the difference between belief and faith? Faith is belief in action. She could have just stayed home and been completely fine. But faith took that next step. Even the demons believe, remember? But she took that step to go out in faith. You are healed because of your... Watch. So she gets there to Jesus Finally, and how scary that must have been to get through that crowd of people who knew she would be unclean. She may have been hiding herself under a hood or whatever it may be, or just kind of get lost in the crowd a little bit. But she finally makes her way up to Jesus. And mind you, Jairus is still sitting here just impatiently waiting to see what the heck is going on. And why is my Jesus talking to somebody else? But she's there, and she gets to just glimpse of Jesus. And she said, if only I can just touch his garment, I will be healed. Notice what she doesn't say, okay? She, said, May, she didn't say, maybe I'll be healed. When you're in faith, you don't say maybes. She said, if I touch him, I will be healed. She just heard about Jesus. And she's already having tremendous faith. She just heard about Jesus. See, her, her faith was proportionate to her knowledge. We know way up here, and sometimes our faith is way down here. But she just heard about Jesus, and she already says, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. That's all. So she goes up to him, and he's walking through the crowd, and she just touches. She doesn't even get to rub his back, nothing. She just touches a piece of his coat. Just touches it. Imagine this. Let's do something weird, okay? Flex your arms as hard as you can. Now flex your stomach. Flex your legs. Flex everything together. All right, just do it. It feels weird, right? All right, three. We're going to let go. Two. One. Let go. Immediately she was healed. Immediately she was healed. Twelve years 
she just touches like a thread of his coat. Immediately, she is healed. And then what does she do? She turns around. Remember those ten lepers? She turns around, and she just goes back into the crowd and kind of hides away. But remember that one leper? And Jesus immediately stops on his code blue mission. Get there, stat, doc. He just stops, and he turns around and says, Who touched me? And actually, if you read what it says, right after that, verse 32, not only does it say, Who touched me? The disciples, when we know later, Peter says, Jesus, you're ridiculous. Everybody's touching you. This is a crowd full of people. Jesus keeps looking around. Verse 32, Jesus kept looking around. Somebody touched him. You've heard this before, but there's a crowd of people, thousands of people, something like a church, right? Just thousands of people, and one person touches him in faith. Everybody else comes for their own reasons because they've been going, because they, they, it's just normal to do, their friend took them, whatever it is. But then there's one person that just reaches out to him and touches him in faith. And he keeps on looking for that person. Where on earth he kept looking for that person? Why? Who cares, Jesus? Just keep going. She's dying over there. Just go. Why is he looking? Why does he keep on looking? He's looking in this crowd. He didn't, it's not like he didn't know who it was. He's trying to teach the crowd a lesson. Show the crowd the kind of people that he came to save. This is actually the woman that I came here for. The people that you're rejecting, that you hate, that you don't like, that you're pushing out of your synagogue, Jairus. This is the kind of woman that I came to save. To endorse her. To show that it doesn't matter who you are, what you believe, whatever. If you run like crazy to Jesus, you will be saved. But look, that woman could have gone, and, and, and maybe, she, maybe she gets a little thread of the, the garment, right? And she says, anybody touches this thread, you will be healed. This is a magical thread. If you touch it, just like I did, you will be healed. And so in order to show that it wasn't some magic or sorcery or whatever it was, to show her what actually healed her, Jesus is looking for her too. Because look, the reason why that thread healed her was it because it was connected to Jesus. Hmm, what am I saying? It's not the amount of our faith that matters there should be a little bit of peace of mind for you. It's not the amount of our faith that matters. It's who that faith is connected to. So she touches it. Immediately she's healed. And then she's terrified. Wow. Finally got a little glimpse of the power of the Almighty God. She's terrified. And he kept asking who touched me? Looking, who is it? And she kind of just scurries forward a little bit. It was me. It was me. And Jesus, they were waiting for her to get thrown out. Remember how the disciples would push children out of the way or push Bartima Bartimaeus out of the way or push women like this out of the way? And Jesus, just, just get out of here. We've got to go. Daughter, my daughter, my sweet daughter, your faith, not my jacket, not your ostrich eggs, not all the stuff that you've been trying, but your faith in me has made you well. Come to me, all who are weary. Next thing we know is she's telling her whole story. She's telling her whole story. Where are we? 33, thank you. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Do you remember when 
Do you remember when the ten lepers, he heals the ten lepers of their leprosy, and they walk away, and then how many have come back? One, and he comes back, and do you remember what Jesus says? Right, and then he says, your faith. So remember, he was already healed. He already lost leprosy, but now he's coming back. This woman was already healed, but now she's coming back, and now her faith has made her well or whole. So remember when we pray and we want all this stuff and we just like, oh, if you just, I remember when I was a kid, it was ridiculous. I prayed that I could be shorter, right? We just pray for all these ridiculous things and, ah, oh, if I could just get this, I'll be better. And then we run like crazy to Jesus and our faith in Jesus actually makes us whole. Not all the other stuff. She wasn't whole. She wasn't well because she was healed, The leper wasn't well, wasn't whole because he was healed. We're not going to be well or whole because we get all these different things that we're asking for. That might increase our faith because we get what we want and then we decrease our faith when we don't get what we want. Her faith in Jesus is what made her whole. And by the grace of God, he made her whole. And it says, at that moment, she told her whole story. If you confess me before man, I'm going to go to the Father for you. If you confess me before men. And so she tells her whole story. I have a wife. And if she told her whole story, (laughs) right? But we know. So Jairus runs to Jesus. Daughter's at the edge of death, right? How long do you think it passed? Watch. Jairus ran to Jesus. She's at the edge of death. By the time they actually get there, not only is she dead, they're already playing the music and all this kind of stuff like that. Maybe hours pass. She's telling her story, and Jesus is talking to her, and there's this large crowd just watching what on earth is happening, hearing her story, and hearing how she was healed, and hearing how going to Jesus made her whole. And she tells her whole story, and while she's talking, somebody walks up to Jairus and whispers the worst news that a parent can get. Your daughter is dead. Just leave the teacher alone. Leave him alone. Your daughter's dead. Isn't it great when somebody tells you horrible news and then tells you not not to handle it? She's dead. And the amount of faith that it would have taken Jairus to get to Jesus in the first place. This might be the cap. This is kind of where my faith stops, Jesus. This is the limit of my faith. It can't go any more than this. This is where it stops, Jesus. Who can relate? This is where my faith stops. So so, so I'm, I'm good now, Jesus. You didn't do what I asked you to. I didn't get what I want. I'm good. I'm good on my own. But immediately, 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 Jesus says something. And remember, this woman is telling her whole story, and she's seeing how God worked in her life. And Jairus, remember, Jairus sees all of this. Watch this. He's seen all of this stuff that's happening. While he's waiting for his miracle, while he's waiting for God to work in his life, he gets to see God work in somebody else's life. While he's waiting for his prayer to come through, he sees everybody else's prayers coming through. And all of a sudden, this is how faith works. Sometimes we don't always get what we want, but we see God moving. So he gets to hear the whole story, and his faith gets to just kind of attach to this woman's story a little bit. And through that, he gets to grow his own faith. And Jesus immediately looks at him. The same thing he's saying to us. He says, don't fear. Oh, I love this. Do not be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. In other words, our fear is attached to our amount of faith. Little faith, great fear. 
Great faith, little fear. Don't be afraid, just believe. So finally, he's back. And he just doesn't know what they're going to do. And so Jesus grabs three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, verse 37. And all of a sudden, we're going to see how faith unlocks God's doing in our life. I remember I was talking to George Harris. He told me a crazy story. Every one of George's stories is crazy. And uh, he told me how he was in chemo during radiation, stage three cancer, basically not given a good prognosis, and he's in an ambulance. This is ridiculous. He's in an ambulance, and they take him out of the gurney, and they're taking him into the hospital for treatment. This is a man with tremendous faith. They take him out in the gurney, pushing him into the hospital, and while they're pushing him in, he sees a car for sale. And eventually they, they roll him up. He wants to see the car before they take him into the hospital. They roll the gurney up to the car so he can look in the car. And this man on chemo, on radiation, stage three cancer, ends up buying that car. How much faith do we have? How much faith do we have? And where is our faith? Remember in Hebrews eleven six, it says the only way, the only way to please God, wait, what? The only way to please God is with faith. But they start walking, walking and walking to get to the house. And again, if Jesus was a doctor, he would have been fired. This is ridiculous. A code blue, this kid is dying. Get there quick, Jesus. Get there. And then there's Jesus just chilling, talking to some lady. Go, Jesus, go. No, nah, I'm, I'm on my time. So they start walking to the house. At this time, and back then in, in Palestine and in Syria and Rome and these areas, when, when somebody would pass away, the first thing that they would do within an hour or so, some people say, they would have flute players there, at least two flute players there. And then they would have, if they could afford it, they'd have mourners that they would hire to come. And if they could afford it, they'd have people ripping their clothes and all this different stuff. So you can imagine that faith that, that Jairus had, remember? Remember? When they got there, the sound that he would have heard. He got back to his home, and there's just the horrifying sound that he would have heard when he gets home. It's his baby. His baby. It's real. I hear it. I hear it. I hear it. I don't know what you're going to do, Jesus. I have no idea what you're going to do in my life right now, but I'm still walking with you. I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm still going to walk with you right now, Jesus. And they get there, and they walk inside, and, and they must have greeted Jesus and probably reminded him, he's dead, she's dead, she's dead. And Jesus, sweet Jesus says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And they laughed at him. Sometimes you're walking with Jesus and the whole crowd is coming against you and they're saying their things and, and they're just mocking you. And as long as you're just walking with Jesus, just keep going. Just keep going. And they just laugh at him and, and some translations say they scoff at him. And they keep on walking. She's not dead. She's just asleep. these men and women that were hired to grieve. We'll conclude here in a minute. They were professional grievers. They were literally paid to go do stuff like this. They were so used to grieving that when hope came, they laughed. 
They were so used to grieving. This was just, they were just stuck in grief. This was their thing, that when hope finally came, they just laughed. If you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. They just laughed. They scoffed at him. And they were stuck in their grief. And he walks inside, and he pushes back all these people. Remember how the resurrection is going to work. He pushes back all these people that are just laughing and, and doubting and, and saying no to hope, and he just pushes them past, and he walks through with the believers. And he takes three of his men, and he takes two people. Who was it? The mom and the dad. How does intercessory prayer work? What was it? Remember this girl who's laying dead in bed. And the mom and the dad run like crazy. Go crazy, whatever it costs. I don't care what people think about me. Jairus runs like crazy to Jesus. What is our job as a parent? Where are we putting all of our emphasis as parents? What are we doing? Our job is to take them to Jesus. And so he runs like crazy to Jesus. And Jesus comes back with him. And he goes to the home. And I remember when I bought her that bed and now she's dead in it. I would scratch my baby's back and she's dead. She got worse and worse. And all the vitals were going down. And nothing seemed to improve. And all the numbers and everything were just going down and down and down. And I tried everything and nothing worked. And Jesus says, she's just asleep. Look at how Jesus just softens the blow of death. Just softens the blow of death. Death sometimes is our only way out of suffering. And by God's grace, he created death so that we can get out of suffering. And he says, I know this is hard for you. I know it looks like, like this is the worst situation possible. I know it just, it's sad, and I know that you love her, and I love her too. I know this is hard right now, but she's just asleep. Just believe me. Life is just a, a vapor, but she's going to wake up. And you see Jesus at the right hand of God, and he lets go of heaven, and he comes down to earth, and he takes his hand, and he reaches out, Talitha, my little angel, my sweet little girl. You see how he lets go of heaven to come down to earth and grab our hands, and humanity just takes his hands and throws it up on a cross. And they leave him there. Just leave him there to die. But our faith, connected with Jesus, our faith, connected with Jesus, one day will translate to him coming back and reaching out his hand to us. Not with him just walking into a room, but with trumpets and clouds of glory, and him coming down to earth and saying to us, Arise, my daughters and my sons, my good and faithful servants, your faith has made you well. Praise God. Let's pray together. Lord God, the first face the little girl saw when she opened her eyes, the first face that we will see when we open our eyes will be the face of our Creator, the face of hope, the face of love. Lord, 
help us. Some of us have lost our faith. Some of us have given up. Some of us don't have what it takes to run to Jesus anymore. But Lord, only you can restore us. Faith is not something that we work at. It's a gift from God. So we're begging of you this morning, Lord, give us that faith. Even if it's just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Give us faith, Lord, to continue running to you. Even when the world is laughing,